What's up, everybody? I am Johnny Christ, and this is Drinks with Johnny. Thank you so much for tuning in to another week. We've got a very special uh, guest today. It is, uh, we're, we're days away from Father's Day, so I brought on someone uh, that I think you guys know as father, and you're going to get to know him a little bit better as well. Um, but before we get that, quick reminder, everybody, make sure you subscribe and turn on your notifications right here in the app, as well as heading over into your phone settings, turn on the notifications there. The YouTube channels have uh, allowed creators to get in touch with you guys a little bit better. So we're gonna start doing that. So you're gonna wanna turn on your notifications and so that you do not miss anything Drinks With Johnny related. Now, as I said, Father's Day is on Sunday. Uh, we're celebrating a little early here and talking to uh, someone who I'm really a huge fan of him and his father. I'm so excited to have him here today. Louis Prima Jr., how the hell are you today, man? I'm doing great, Johnny. How are you, man? I'm a big fan as well. So, oh, he, thank you. This one's mutual. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, brother. So, where are you? At, uh, where are you coming to us from today? I am. Uh, I moved to New Orleans, Louisiana, um, in August, in the middle of all this uh, pandemic stuff. So, I'm uh, back home in New Orleans and loving it. Awesome, man. Yeah, I saw uh, some of your posts on Instagram, which everyone could go find you on Louis Prima Jr. on Instagram. Uh, you having the Saints, the New Orleans the New Orleans Saints uh, uh, Super Bowl ring. How did you manage that? Dude, there's a, there's a two restaurants out here. Back when I uh, was a little kid in Covington, Louisiana, which is uh, North Lake, so it's across Lake Pontchartrain, there was a little restaurant called Sal and Judy's. Um, Sal and Pastata's from Sicily, barely spoke English back then, and his brother owns a restaurant in New Orleans called Impastato's. Um, they make the olive oil that I use. They, he, he, uh, they own their own olive oil company in Sicily. And he is probably the biggest Saints fan in New Orleans. He takes one or two trips a year where he charters an airplane and brings all his friends uh, to a Saints game. Uh, he's the only non-football entity to have a ring. So he actually... Uh, I just took a picture, too, with the Lombardi Trophy. He had it in his restaurant for a few days. Uh, I tried to get away with the ring. He tackled me at the door. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So you're talking about restaurants right there. And I know uh, before you got back into music, you were uh, managing a food and beverage company as well. You were doing a lot of restaurant and stuff like that. Can you, can you talk to me a little bit about your, your affinity for food and drink? Absolutely. Look, my mom's, uh, the Mayon family, my mom's uh, grandfather was born on the boat coming over from Italy, Thomas Mayon. Uh, the East Coast is riddled with restaurants owned by the Mayon family. My grandfather owned the first Italian bakery in New York. Uh, he owned a restaurant and a nightclub in Toms River, New Jersey and, and Seaside Heights where they did uh, um, a couple of the spring break things. But uh my, aunt, my uncle's own restaurants. So restaurants have always been in the family. And especially with my father, you know, food was uh, food in the Italian community is very important. It's communal yeah. on Sundays and things. So, yeah, when I uh, when I gave music a rest after rock and roll back in the 90s, I just I got into restaurant management rather quickly. Uh, and my last job was uh, assistant general manager of food and beverage for the airport in Las Vegas. Um, I, I enjoy it, but, uh, you know, music is my soul and it's where I belong, but it afforded me an opportunity to raise my children and provide them with a house. And I, I was really fed up with the music industry back then. So, uh, it, it took a lot of right, um, took a lot of right things happening all at the same time that got me back in the business and I'm thankful for it. Yeah. I mean, let's go back a little bit before because you just touched upon uh, the rock and roll in the 90s. What was that? That was band was called Problem Child, if I'm not correct. If yes, I'm not mistaken, sir. Right? Yeah. Yep. And what kind we, of music uh, were you guys playing? And uh, what, what, I mean, what was it uh, from that experience that rubbed you the wrong way and, and, and put you into the food <laughs> and, and beverage industry? Well, I, I guess my main problem is I've always been kind of a business manager. So I'm the guy that reads the contract and, and, yeah. uh, won't let myself get screwed, but uh, we uh, we formed. I started putting, um, you know, I started going to college, and and I was sitting in with friends and things, and you uh, uh, doing different things. And I, I play a hundred million instruments. I'm not good at any of them. Um, <laughs> it's, I mean, look, I I beg to I, We'll this, get into that, dude. <laughs> well, look, when I, when I when I was young, I I was like, you know, if I can't be the 
Eddie Van Halen of this instrument. If I can't play trumpet like my father, I, I kind of don't want to do it. I want to be the best that I can do. And there were a lot of things about soloing that mystified me until I figured out I was dyslexic. But um, so I, when I got a microphone in my hand and realized that front man was a thing and I could sing and, and entertain people that way, that's really what hooked me. And I started putting bands together shortly after high school. I graduated in 83 and in 86 had the permanent roster with problem child. And we, uh, we did it for nine, almost 10 years. I gave it up in 95, um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, the, the music business can be very frustrating. Um, you know, you, you're dealing, I, I tell people, you know, when they watch a show like American Idol back in the early days and Simon Cowell, uh, you know, everybody was how rude is he and how nasty is he? And it's like, dude, that is everybody in the music business because yeah. Brutal, they, brutal they're honesty. not going to, dude. They're they're not going to tell you you're good if they don't think you're good. Um, and we kind we kind of hit our stride. We were, look, I'm a I when Kiss was saving the world from disco, I found ACDC. Um, nice. So I lean I lean a little heavier on that on the old ACDC. I sang in an ACDC tribute band up until 2007. Yeah, so were, you hit, um, were you hitting all those high notes with uh, with with Bon Scott and and, and Brian Johnson? So back in my rock days, like in the ni- or 80s and 90s, I could hit every Brian Johnson note, but those notes are finite, especially when you're clubbing through the L.A. circuit and things. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> the um, I, I can't hit. Well, I literally uh, two days ago, somebody called me on stage and I just shook me all night long for the first time in a long time. And I actually hit every note and I was a little surprised. But uh, Bon Scott's more the forte when it comes to that. So we were... Uh, and, and I leaned on my father's influences. So we bought in a lot of elements of what Jane's addiction was doing with, you know, some offbeat stuff. And, you know, it wasn't really straight ahead. Uh, I was, you know, much to my current keyboard player chagrin writing songs in five, four and things. So it was, uh, <laughs> we were doing a lot of different things, but it was mainly upbeat and happy. And, um, we came in at the tail end of, uh, you know, really gained our popularity toward the tail end of uh, when Guns N' Roses was taking everybody off and uh, grunge started happening and grunge became this thing that I don't understand. I mean, God bless them, but that's depression for the sake of depression. And it just wasn't me. Yeah, it wasn't for me. And and they, you know, uh, (laughs) you know, my, uh, I had introduced my guitar player to Mark Slaughter very early on, you know, because Slaughter's a Vegas guy and, you know, we kind of grew up through this together and uh, they became really good friends and Slaughter started helping him with his playing and musical ideas and came in one day and said, look, if you um, sing like grunge and do some grunge songs, I'll shop you a deal. And we had already had some, you know, major label interest, a lot of uh, independent labels and the rest of the band didn't want to go in that direction. And I said, bye bye. Um, I am just, I don't want to be depressed and I don't want to play music that somebody else wants me to do. I know that's probably not popular in this day and age with pop music, but that's, you know, I, I've never been like that. I, I do music because I love it and I love the expression that it gives me. And I love uh, telling my story or someone else's story through my lyrics or through my songs. And I can't do that if somebody else is telling me what to do. No, of course. I mean, any, anybody that wants to put music in a box creatively is, is, Let's just say it, they're wrong, in my opinion. <laughs> that's just, that's, just right. not, that's not art anymore. But I want to touch upon something you just, you just kind of glossed over. Uh, it, you, you were speaking about soloing and stuff, maybe specifically on the trumpet or uh, just soloing on one of the many instruments you play. But you mentioned that you found out you were dyslexic and that affected things. How did that affect it for you? What, what do you mean by that? So I, um, when, I, when I got my SAT scores back going into college, um, the – uh, I took them at UNLV in Las Vegas and they uh, sent me this big box of stuff and come meet with counselors. And uh, cause I scored really high and they called me in and sat me down and asked, said, you know, you, we, we at first thought, you know, sorry for the delay. We thought you had cheated. Um, so we had to go through records because you scored so high yet in school you were miserable. Yeah. So how did you, <laughs> how did you go from this, completely like, mediocre. They're wondering who you copied hear. off of. They're wondering who you copied off. Exactly. Of. <laughs> so they put me through a battery of tests that yielded the fact that I'm just 
extremely like worst case scenario dyslexic. I mean, to this day, it's, it's so funny. Like I get in arguments with my sons and my girlfriend all the time because I'll say a word and it's just not the right word. It's close. Yeah. And they'll look at me like I'm nuts. And I'm like, you, you got to remember, that's the way my brain works. I'll say cakes instead of pies, biscuits instead of donuts. I still don't know which direction an S or a five goes. Wow. So it's weird thing. It's weird things like that. So I, um, I, I had one of the, my high school years, I had one of the most brilliant band directors. I mean, he went on to Akron state and a lot of different colleges and he, I mean, he yielded, uh, Cleto Escobedo, who was uh, Jimmy Kimmel's musical director mm-hmm. on sax and, and some other brilliant players. Um, and I understood theory. I, I understood what they were trying to tell me and, and key changes and all this stuff. I just couldn't make this and this work in tandem. It never, I know what I want to play. It just, doesn't, this doesn't work. Gotcha. Um, so it just, it became frustrating because I wanted to be a good soloist. I mean, I could be a bit player. I, I, that's not me. I've always, the reason why I'm always in management, I don't like working for people. I like to be the boss and I like to be the boss of what I'm doing. So I enjoy playing. Um, I enjoy playing drums the most because it's a little bit easier as far as, you know, getting away with a solo but uh it just it was it's it's a weird thing to explain to a layman you'll understand that mm-hmm. it just it you know there's yeah. a lot going on to make what comes out of the speaker work absolutely and, um it just never made sense to me it just it just wouldn't work yeah that's a, well i mean i mean we'll get to how you overcome that how you have overcome that because you did some stuff uh with your with you and the witness now, the re, the revamp of the witness. Uh, we'll get to that in right. a second, though. I just you touched upon uh, learning the drums early on. I believe it was your. I read somewhere that it was your mother that taught you how to play the drums. It was it. It was my mother. I got a little picture floating somewhere around on my social media that I was five years old, sitting behind one of the like this. I don't even know if they made mini kits back then, a tiny little set, and I had a. It's funny. I had a the, the the left hand drumstick was thicker than the right one, and they were metal. One was red, and one was blue. Yeah. And my mom, my mom, um, you know, was a. I mean, music ran in her family too. My grandfather had a bar uh, called the Red Top on Seaside Heights, and he had a B three in the bar. Oh wow! And would play it for patrons. Um, so th- there was always music there. Uh, my aunt, on my mom's side, did music all the time, uh, and my mother besides being a fantastic singer, was an accomplished pianist and played the drums and was actually really good at it. And uh, I don't remember who got the set for it for me, but uh, she taught me how to, you know, play boom, chick, boom, boom. It's in my brain. I can still hear her <laughs> teaching me how to play. And I enjoy the drums. It's, it's a good good thing to get aggression out on. And I, oh, I, yeah. It's I fun. do it a lot in our shows. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. So, you, so uh you, you talked a, bit, a little bit about about your mom uh, being a vocalist as well, and she was, she she came in and did uh, some of the Keely Smith stuff towards the end there, right? Uh, she came in as Keely Smith new addition, if you will, um, to your father's. Pretty, uh, pretty much, people always, um, you know, by virtue of, uh, I guess the world became a little bit smaller with TV and things like that back in that day, but a lot of people associate my father and Keely, like Keely with my father as the fame and my father, you know, he started in the thirties and he always had brilliant people with him. He had Lillian Carroll. Um, there was another girl. I can't think of her name, uh, singing with him, uh, especially in the big band when he started bringing in, you know, little production numbers. Uh, and that's when Keely joined and then they went to Vegas, couldn't get work. Uh, Conned uh, Bill Miller, I believe, at uh, the Sahara into letting him play in the corner of the room and bought a couple people up from New Orleans. Sandy Terror, one of them. Well, I want, and kind of hit I it big. I want to show you because you brought up the Sahara and uh, Vegas. <laughs> and I've got right the record on. right here of uh, yep. Louis Prima style Las Vegas with yep. Keely Smith. So this, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong on the pronunciation. Is it Sam B- uh, Batera? Butera, Butera, like okay. butane, butera. Yeah, butane, butera. Yeah. So my mom, uh, you know, uh, my father and Keely with their marital problems, whatever, they they kind of split up in about '59. 
Uh, my father did about a year, year and a half by himself and did some auditions and hired my mother in 60, um, 61, I believe. No, 62. Uh, the, in May, Mother's Day, she got hired actually oh, wow. in uh, 62. She was 21 years old and uh, her first, uh, he, the, the auditions were a Thursday, Friday night, she opened Basin Street Eats in New York and Saturday she was on the Ed Sullivan show. So it was that's, yeah, that's thrown into the thrown into the walls. <laughs> and what a lot of you know, there's I run into a lot of people that will quote, you know, um, start singing songs or mention songs referencing Keeley. They were actually my mom, um, and it's it's you know it's just word association. My mother was actually there for the more. Uh, my father played to more people, bigger venues, uh, had a bigger uh, stamp. Uh, footprint on the music business with my mother. Um, you know, when you talk about the at pack, seeing them at the Sands, uh, that was my mother on stage, not yeah. Keely. So there, there's a little bit of misconception, but uh, she, uh, to, you know, with the exception of Lillian Carroll, because I really loved her voice. She had a little list thing going on. My mom had a fantastic voice, really an untapped talent. She gave up her career to raise uh, my sister and I, um, which uh, thank you, but uh, it's unfortunate for her because she 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 actually was going to be number one on the charts, but Nancy Sinatra came out with "Boots Are Made for Walking" uh, and uh, kicked her down the charts. So yeah, uh, but I, I loved her voice; great voice. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that a little bit there. Now let's get into so, so we we talked about the rock that you did getting into the, into the uh, food and beverage. Before we move on from that real quick, actually, I want to ask you, what is your favorite go-to meal and drink? Like, like you're, con- you're, you're doing a combo, you know, you got last meal you're going to have, something along those lines. What has it got to be? La- last meal would have to be a saltambuco, which is a veal with uh, prosciutto, provolone, mm. a little bit of sauce over spaghetti. And a good bottle of wine. Um, I've always been a Chianti fan. I've recently become addicted to a good Amarone, but my uh, wallet is going to kill me for the, <laughs> for the price of it. But uh, yeah, um, you know, v- vodka is my go-to regular drink. Whiskey is my sip and drink. Wines, wine's a good meal. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm I'm a I'm a huge veal fan. I like Oso Buco. I uh, probably made my best Oso Buco a couple of years ago on Christmas, but uh, uh, I'm a foodie. I, I love food. It's I, There's a reason I go to the gym every day, and it's not, you know, so much to stay <laughs> you know, healthy. It's not because you're a I gym rat. Food. It's a, Yeah, it's not because you're a gym rat. It's because you, 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 you like to eat a lot. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm the same I way. I love food. I love um, food and drink, too. And uh, that, I'm the same way. I work out like crazy just so that I can go eat and drink what I want. <laughs> It's, it's, it's literally the main reason I go to the gym, you know? Uh, but well, look, look, I, I'd be a happy fat kid, but nobody wants a fat rock star. I've always said, so I, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta stay in shape. Yeah. yeah. I want to, I want to be around a long time doing what I do. And I just, I love food and I'm man, am I in the town for it? I cannot believe how much I missed the, the food and the culture around food Yeah, uh, that happens nice, yeah. in New Orleans, you know? Oh no! I'm I'm just glad everything's getting back to normal. And you you did mention you you start off with a like more of a vodka guy. Is that is that like a mar, uh, martini? When you have a martini, you do uh, vodka. I was a uh, I, I like a good martini periodically, but I'm an absolute on the rocks guy. Just um, absolute on the rocks. Okay. I used to back on the, yeah. Just I used to drink it in a brandy snifter so I wouldn't spill it. And, uh, <laughs> that is true because you start to fall over. It's it, the gravity, right. take, it just, gravity it takes over. It just does with it. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I just recently became more of a whiskey fan. Um, uh, American found, whiskey uh, or Basil Hayden port. Oh, Basil Hayden. Yeah. Basil Hayden port. Yeah. They have a port that's uh, um, mixed with a port wine that is just amazing. So now I'm trying all different, you know, um, whiskeys i'm a huge woodford fan but uh uh it's it's good for sipping it it keeps me vodka i can drink gallons of it um <laughs> whiskey i drink when i don't want to you know when i'm going to be out for a long time because i want to be able to 
function. <laughs> yeah, I got you. No, I hear you. There's there's different spirits uh, for different drunks, I guess, is, is, is kind of where, where it goes. Absolutely. <laughs> 100 percent 100 percent wine wine will put me to sleep so if i drink wine when i go out i'm done yeah I'm like end of the meal i'm like take me home <laughs> well that that's always a good way to go but let's get now let's get into uh some of some of your music uh in 2012 you released the return of the wildest which is obviously an homage to this record if everyone could see it right here louis prima's uh you wildest. got the wildest right on yeah yeah uh, probably my favorite uh of your father's record um, records as a whole. I mean, um, but uh, it might be one of the most popular. I mean, all the it's it's hit after hit on that on that record, and uh, so obviously it absolutely it absolutely is. Yeah. So you do an homage to it. Um, you do a couple covers on it as well. When you when you decide to start back into music and it's no longer rock and you're kind of you know you're you're maybe for the first time putting out Louis Prima Jr with the witness, um, you know, kind of, uh, stepping up to that name. What was, what, what was the feeling like when you're getting into the studio to record this record in 2012? Well, it was, it was a long process back, you know, back when I was uh, toward the tail end of my rocks, rock days, um, uh, Royal crown reviews started playing swing music and, uh, and I was friends with them and saw a swing, starting on the starting to make a rise i knew brian setzer was going to do something um so when i gave up music i actually put a band together briefly uh kind of a different mindset like i, I really wanted to just stay in vegas and and you know play my father's music and play music for a living and it just didn't I, I don't know whether it was the band or what, or me or, or whatever the story was, didn't work. Yeah. And I, I like ditched it really quick. Um, so you flash forward and um, if you're familiar with Shrapnel Records, uh, uh, Mike Varney has been a long time friend, long time friend of mine. And I get a random phone call that's uh at first he says, I am hot. And when I'm not finish that sentence and he hangs up the phone. Um, <laughs> and you know, that's the opening line of problem child. And I'm like, all right, who the hell is this? And the next phone call is uh, quoting a song that I had wrote the same way. And then he calls me finally. And it's like, it's Mike Varney. I'm putting on a show and tribute to your father. Would you be interested in coming out singing? And the next day, like I said, sure. And it was a few weeks away. And the next day I ran into an old friend of mine from the rock days that had an opportunity for a Louis Primus type band. And uh, it all kind of just worked in tandem to where I sat down and I said, look, um, I, I've, I've dealt with the musicians in Vegas. And I, I, if you find me a musical director, somebody will uh, help me out, uh, get finding the band that I want. And uh, sure, let's try this. I, I'd love to get back on stage, but everybody has to know that we talked to that my goal is not to play Louis Prima music. My goal is to take this style and move it forward into the future. You know, I, I, I think in the different levels of the music business, uh, my, where I fit in, I, I like to be a creator. I like to write music and I like people to, enjoy what I like to do. I'm, I've never been in a cover band of the ACDC tribute band. Like I've never done covers. Um, so where I love my father and I 100% love the music and enjoy playing it, it's still a cover band and I would rather take it as a tool to get where I want to go. So the, the immediate process was finding like-minded musicians, people who were number one entertainers because uh, for all the brilliant chart readers in the world, I cannot be on the stage with people that stand there. It just, um, yeah. I want people that want the microphone. For me, I want people that want, know how to jump around, learn a song, and know how to perform. So that that was a, shoot, I started this about 2004, 2005, and in 2010, I think I had the like-minded band, so we started moving forward. And then when the opportunity came to record, it was, uh, what are we going to do? And I said, well, look, everybody loves the premium music. We have to play certain numbers during every show. Let's just get that out of the way so we can move forward. Yeah. Um, so we 
we went in and recorded the, you know, Return of the Wildest are all prima songs that were my father recorded one time. They're, you know, loose mix of what I feel are my favorites. And let's get that out of the way. And then we can move forward. And just by sheer happenstance, we met uh, Jim Urban from Warrior Records, who uh, had the same mindset and said, let's uh, do this together. And, uh, you know, who'd have, who'd have thunk at 45 years old, you finally get a record deal. But at 45 years old, I finally got a record deal. Wow. And he's of a like mind. He wants, he enjoys, um, you know, and he contributes to our creative process and, and has put us in Capitol Records now twice. Uh, we just got done finishing recording number three and should be getting it out uh, in the fall. But uh, it's, uh, you know, like I said, for 45 years old, I got a record deal. Who, who the hell thinks that's going to happen? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Number two, <laughs> number two, I'm fortunate. It, it's just it's just the weirdest thing to me and now i'm doing what i've wanted to do all along which is create perform for people uh make the world happy one song at a time yeah no that's that's a great that's a great philosophy right there so you mentioned uh, uh the return of the wildest uh doing a bunch of uh your father's songs uh one of them that uh i wanted to talk about was your interpretation of i want to be like you from the jungle book i've i've recently you know i have a 4 year old son now and uh, right on. yeah, and we've gone back and, you know, Disney plus we're watching all this stuff and I'm listening to it and I, I see uh, Louis, the, the orangutan going crazy. And, I, and I'm like remembering it when I saw it as a kid, reliving yeah. it. And, uh, you know, I was telling, and I started showing my son the wildest because I listen to that record all the time. I'm like, it's, it's Louis, the orangutan and he's listening to it and stuff. And then I hear your interpretation of it. And it's definitely like a, like a new take on it. Um, what was it? I mean, you still kept the upbeatness, maybe even sped it up a little bit, but, uh, and brought in some really, really great grooves on, uh, specifically on the drums in there. Um, Thank you. Uh, what, what, what was the inspiration there? I mean, obviously it's a cover uh, to, to an extent, but you, you're putting your own flavor on it. The, for the most part, when I think of a cover, I think you've got to, change things up a little bit if you're going to do a cover for whatever band, whatever. Um, if you try to stay too, too too true to the arrangement, you know, then why did you do it? Yeah. Um, but when we went to record this and we were, we sat down and started making a list of songs, um, we, we didn't even play I Want to Be Like You live at all. And as we started touring, um, it became a very requested song that we just didn't do. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I have no answer as to why it wasn't in the set. I, I don't know. I think I thought, I think I thought it was so iconic that if you didn't have the middle part with the, you know, with the witness, my dad's witnesses pretend, you know, being the monkeys and, you know, the banter back and forth. I felt like if that wasn't in there, the song was going to lose something. Then as I thought about it some more, you know, the song I Want to Be Like You is uh, kind of a, I don't know, kind, kind of not ironic. Iron, irony is not the good word. I may need to call on Alanis Morissette and check with her, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, not irony, but it, it's, you know, with what I was trying to do, it's it's a little poetic. Yes. Uh, yeah. So so let me So let me take it and it's really the one song that we really did take on that album and twist in the direction that I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Not fully, but I, you know, putting the organ in there and, and the drum beats and uh, some of the things we did and changing the lyrics ever so slightly uh, to where it wasn't so much as, you know, man you know, cub and things like that. I don't mean to cut you off there, but I do have to mention uh, lyrically, I, I do think it was brilliant and, it, and it, it, it points to your poetic point there a second ago where uh, you don't know where uh, Louis uh, Louis B uh, Louis, Louis ends, ends and Prima, and Prima Jr. Jr. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a great line there. So it was it was done a lot on purpose. That was the song that I just wanted on the album. It was the first one that I said I need to record this, and I want to do this with it. And I had sat I had sat by myself for a long time and thought about the arrangement and how I wanted it to go. And I you know I've got people. 
uh, a couple critics that came and said they prefer the original. And I was like, I prefer the original, but this is what I need to do yeah. in order to move forward. Cause if I don't move forward, um, you know, where do you go from there? If I, I, I don't like moving lateral. So it was a concerted effort to move it forward. Uh, and thank you for enjoying the arrangement. Cause it's, uh, it's very poetic to me when I sing it, it's very meaningful to me. And it's look, it's, it's the one song that you can play in any country to any fan base, any age, and they know the song. Oh yeah. You know, when somebody says, when somebody says, who's Louis Prima and you go, hold on, I got one. And, <laughs> you know, you put that, <laughs> you know, you it's play funny. that. they know what it is. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that though. Cause I, I, I do feel that uh, that way for a lot of people. They, they might not know Louis Prima, uh, the name, but they know the songs. I mean, they've been in so many movies, yes. let alone anything like, um, and over the years, uh, before we go on to blow, I want to talk a little bit about, since we're in the, in the, the vein of covers right now, over the years, there's been so many covers. And I feel like a lot of people of these new generations don't even realize their covers. Like famously in the rock world, you know, David Lee Roth did, I'm just a right. gigolo. And, you know, I don't know, you know, I mean, I, I would hope people know that that's a cover, but you know what I mean? That's like, some some don't it's it's surprising you <laughs> yeah. know some don't some don't know jump tribe and whale was my father uh, yeah they yeah certain, uh, brian setzer did a great job yeah. covering it but like i mean that was and there's so many and, people and have covered so many leo prima songs over the years well and you know and i think the biggest one is sing 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 which mm -hmm. um you know uh it's not if, if you bring that song title up to a lot of people they're going to say i don't know that song until they turn on a chips ahoy commercial or watch an ice skating competition or a dancing competition or, or a ge commercial or and, and i could just go on and on swing kids there's a million things um but when i say you know and it's it's the it's the first song ever put in the grammy hall of fame mm -hmm. um it was a you know one of the biggest hits for benny goodman back in the big band days Everybody knows the song. Absolutely nobody knows Louis Prima wrote it. Yeah. And it's, you know, but that's, I think, I think in a way I mirror um, his philosophy. See, he, he modeled his career off the stage. He didn't, he really didn't care about the records and the sales and the, that end of it. He just, he wanted to be on stage making people happy up to the end. And uh, I, I mirror him a, a lot of ways that way. I would, I'd give up the world to be on stage and, you know, that definitely <laughs> un comes across. Un unfortunately, the last year and a half, a lot of us have given up the world just to <laughs> waiting for that stage. Day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're going to be getting up, getting back on stage. Well, this is a perfect time to talk a little bit about it. You got some tour dates yeah. coming up and people could go find those tour dates at Louis Prima junior.com. Correct. Yep. Louis Prima jr.com. Yeah. All it's all on there. Of course, the, calendar is linked through bands in town and you can uh click it to track us and um we have you got some jersey you know, thank god i've got new york la las vegas uh, yes we Cleveland, were michigan michigan we we actually have um about 50 dates right now through the end of september starting in july awesome uh i hope i hope most of them come through you know uh they're gonna fall off the, the booking end of the world right now is a mess I do not envy my agent or my manager at all. <laughs> um, but to the to those that are listening, you know, wondering when we're going to get back down to Florida or Louisiana or um, you know Atlanta and places like that, we're coming. Uh, all our usual venues that we play, we're coming. Um, all the new venues, we had 120 dates in 2020 that canceled. Um, so we're hoping to get. You know, we're hoping to recoup at least a lot of them uh, within the next six months to a year. Uh, we do have the new album coming out and we're going to be torn to support and we're going to come see everybody. Rest assured, we're getting back to it. Um, we can't wait to get back on stage, but oh, yeah. Louis Prima, JR com. that's going to direct you everywhere and you'll know when we're coming to your town. Absolutely. I can't wait for the L.A. show. I hope I hope I'm around for it and, and can come out and check it out. I hope so, too. But uh, yeah, speaking of the stage, though. You guys, you do pay homage just on stage, just by being yourself to your father. I see, like with the with the banter, with the 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 fun, everyone's jumping around and having a good time. You still have, you know, you're accompanied by by a female uh, at most of the time, and then you got your band, the, the Witness. 
And you guys are all just having fun, dancing around and having a good time with it. I mean, and, and I see that even going back to some of those Ed Sullivan shows with your with your father, where you know the the guys in the band are falling all over each other, and you know, and you know, and uh, wooing and and everything on parts, and <laughs> it's it's just it's it's great fun, man. And I, I see that a lot in your performances. Thank you. It's it's a lost element in music, um, uh, and very heavy lost element in the late '90s and stuff. Um, I've always said to people that don't understand why um, the current level of pop music is as big as it is today, you know, because there's not a lot of music involved in it. There's a lot of lights, there's a lot of dancers, there's a lot of choreography, there's a lot of show. And when I go to a show, I want to see it all. I want to see a great band um, playing good music, true to how the music's supposed to sound. I want them to entertain me as well. Uh, you want the light show. So it's uh, music isn't just a audio thing. We could all sit at home and listen to the records all day long. When you go to a show, it's everything involved. And I think a lot of music got very dry stage performance wise. You go see people and they're just standing there and it's like, come on, you know, I could go watch the guy next door with this garage band do the exact same thing. What are you going to do to entertain me? Yeah. Um, no, and you know my father was the greatest showman there there was. People, uh, people came. You know, I still hear it from people in popular music today when you run into him. How much they like the he influences everybody across everywhere with his performance. Um, and I, you know, whether I am emulating or whether it's just in me, that's the way I've been throughout my career. And it was, I, you know, I touched on it earlier. It was important to me looking for musicians and finding a band that I found a band, not hired guys, not, you know, I want a guys that want the stage as much as I do. Um, I, love that. I, I want guys that want to entertain as much as I do. Um, and, uh, you know, by hook or by crook, I found each individual who's brilliant at their, at their instrument, loves to perform and we all have a, I mean, dude, you know, when you're traveling around on a bus with, you know, 12 of your closest friends, it's, Oh yeah, man. You, I know all about it. You, you think, <laughs> but you, you'd, you'd think we'd hate each other by now, but it, it's, it's truly a, a friendship. We all, we all still talk all the time waiting, you know, mm-hmm. looking forward to getting back on the road and it's truly fun. And what we do on stage is, unchoreographed mayhem you know there's a few things that we plan when we're on stage there's a few things that kind of happen every night um but we have an opening number and we have a closing number and what happens in between is up to the crowd me and and you know and who's having a good time what do we what do we want to do you know the sections of the show where everybody gets up and to the mic and sings a song and you don't know what it's going to be tonight and and i it as long as it's fresh for us i think it's fresh for the crowd you know, and, uh, and we, we've had, we've had some amazing crowds that you just, you know, they're jumping and hooting and hollering. And I'm like, that's what a show should be. You know, people sitting in a chair doing this is not a show. No, no, no. You want the energy. You want want it all. I want people to get up, dance, scream, holler. I want them to have the time of their life. And we, um, thankfully, I think we do that. Yeah. Um, I, we get a lot of people all late, you know, I've got the most diverse age group, I think of an act that's out there. Um, and it's all ages. They come to the show and they, they, what does it range from typically? So our, our high end is 35 to 65, but it's flat all the way across it. So there's an equal number and, you know, it drops off before 35. They're still there. Um, but it's 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 like an equal percentage all the way across. You would think there'd be a peak or a valley, and it's not. Uh, and I think it's a I, I think it's a tribute to the hard work we do on the road because we don't. I I've never targeted a specific audience or a specific uh, club or demographic. I want all people. I think this is music everybody should enjoy. Um, you know, I, I think it's in the same league as you know jay giles band back in the day and things like that that it's just a party band having a great time and people you know i they pick up you hear it a lot people they they and we hear it a lot people come after you know i'm one of the few bands uh, when the 
when the band is finishing the last number, I'm running to the front of the auditorium because I do want to shake hands and I do want to meet people. Um, and I think it's important. And then I make, you know, it, early on I made the whole band, but now they all enjoy it. They, they come up to the front and we get to meet people. And absolutely everybody is like, I didn't expect this show to be like this. I didn't expect it to be such a rock show. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when, when you're playing back here again, I, I, there's a maybe a misconception on what type of show I'm doing. Um, because I think there's a misconception of what my father did, unless you saw him live or can watch a video or two. Yeah, they probably wouldn't know. You know yeah, they probably wouldn't know. Again, it goes back to a lot of people don't even realize they've known Louis Prima music their whole lives, you know, so how would they yep, have seen it's, it live? It's been there forever. Yeah. Right. So it's, and it's neat. I, it's, it's neat to be able to touch people. I love the stories of my father that you hear from people um, and what the music meant to them. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a privilege and an honor to carry that on. And I am fortunate to be able to move it forward to create new and keep that style of music going, you know? Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. You mentioned uh, the witness, uh, the band, uh, you got each individual together did that. Let me ask a little bit about when you guys went in to record Blow in 2014, or it was released in 2014. Um, are all these guys uh, part of the witness? Or are they are they all playing on this album? Um, and and how does your process work? So we've had a few changes throughout the years, um, and it's mainly because the road isn't for everybody. Absolutely. Um, and we're and and we are road dogs. And if it's not for you, I understand. Um, but the core members of the band, uh, my drummer, uh, A.D. Adams, um, uh, uh, he's been in the music business 100 years, the, the East Coast circuit. Uh, who did he play for? Trickster for a while. Oh, okay. um, but he's played with it. He's played with everybody in God uh, living in Phoenix right now. Uh, my guitar player, uh, Ryan McKay, is out of Phoenix as well. Um, I actually hired them, met them at the same time uh, with my old bass player, uh, rest in peace, Mikey Bones, was one of my best friends. I'm sorry. Met them, nice. and well, it, and the, and it bought a punk rock element to the music that I really needed and wanted, um, because it, the music is kind of punk rock, you know, it is yeah. kind of rock and roll. Um, so the guitar player Ryan is brilliant. Um, that he's one of the most talented cats I've ever seen. Very, so very knowledgeable in all genres of music and plays exactly what needs to be done and can get up there and rip a rock solo over a jazz tune uh, better than anybody. That's right. Um, so them two and my tenor sax player, Marco Palos. Now, Marco is probably the most talented sax player on the planet right now. Uh, you'll find very few people to argue with me on that. Um, he... He works at Disney. He's in the uh, one of the cast in, at Walt Disney. Uh, oh, shit. He's got his own band uh, that he travels around with. He plays with several other bands. He's a monster, true monster. Um, and we get together. We started getting together in Phoenix. Uh, started on the road a little bit. You, you know, some ideas off each other. What are we going to do for this album? Um, because I want to move it forward. So we first thing to get out of the way was okay, we're going to do a couple Prima tunes and maybe that's it uh, just to get them out of the way, but let's make them our own. Like Robin Hood yeah. uh, was a huge hit from my father in the big band days. And we took that and just twisted it up and made it our own. Um, of course, the, uh, the uh, duet I do with my father. Uh, thank you, Capitol Records for allowing us to do that. And then, so then we, we meet in Phoenix at uh, my drummer's studio. We call it Shabby Roads. And uh, had, had quite a few little writing sessions um, where we just bouncing ideas off each other and working things out. Um, you know, come back down, do another couple writing sessions just to work things out. And uh, Bama, you got some songs. And I think because of the diversity of knowledge, musical tastes, histories that we all have uh, coming into it as four distinct minds coming in with their ideas. We, we end up sounding different and like ourselves, you know? Oh yeah. Um, Your own signature on, on everything. And yeah. it, 
Absolutely. And then, you know, we, once we got everything together and we, we headed into the studio and it, you know, it was the touring band at that time that recorded blow. Um, that was the first time Jim Urban was in the studio with us. Uh, um, he, he and I produced the album together uh, and he is brilliant. Um, he's brilliant in orchestrating uh, vocals in, in, in changing one note within the structure of an entire song that changes the entire song. Wow. He's brilliant at it. Um, and so, so very easy to work with. Um, he's, he's magical to watch him work. And uh, uh, the engineer, David Dominguez, watching them two work together is amazing. Um, you know, especially if you've been to the studio with people that are a wreck. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, um, it, it's just neat to find people that I don't really know what you're talking about, about. I've never been to the <laughs> liar. <laughs> Never, never been. I've never been that guy either. I've never been that guy either. I don't, I don't know. know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's, it's, it was just, it was, <laughs> look, it was just really neat. Um, they're truly fun to work with. Uh, really, in a lot of cases, bought the music that much further than it, than it was. And uh, it was a blast. And I think, and we actually uh, produced and mixed that album down over the phone. Um, I was in Vegas. He was in L.A. And he'd send me a file and I'd listen and change something and send it back. And it uh, where we started with maybe a mindset of a more mellow jazz mix. Uh, I demanded and pressed for the, the rock sound that it got. I wanted it to yeah. be big. I wanted the kick drum to hit you. I wanted the bass to hit you. I wanted it to be a rock album. And I think it is a rock album. I'm Absolutely. very proud of it. Um, I think I think when I listen to it after long absences, even after playing the music on stage and you listen to it and you go, wow, that's a good album, you know? Um, I agree. It took us a little too long to get in the studio for number three, but... Uh, I'm hoping to move it forward, but the, you know, you wanted you wanted to talk a little bit about that's my home. Yeah, um, that's my home. So I, I wanted to ask about it because uh, I know you are also in Capitol Records as, as as you as you said, Capitol Records Studios recording this. It correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I know your dad did a lot of sessions there. Did he do that's my home in that studio as well? Is that why you picked that song? Or yes. So there's a there's a picture on my site from this la I, there there's one if you find it from back in 2014 but there's another one uh, a picture they had actually moved his photo uh, down to the the hallway that goes back to the studios where they got Frank Sinatra they got everybody yeah I've I've been down um, those hallways I, I've seen right. all that stuff it's incredible so his his picture if you're familiar with the studio the the little lounge upstairs of us Studio B yep um. His picture was his picture was up in there at the time we went to record. Um, so it was, and and that's that's the room my father recorded in, and and the room mics were the mics he used. So it's in, and I mean, <laughs> a lot of people don't understand, but you've been in there, and what the echo chambers do to a recording yeah. is magical. Uh, being in that room, being in there is that magical. Room is a legendary I think room. You end We've up done. I mean, everyone's done a lot of orchestrations and stuff because of the way that room sounds. It sounds amazing. Yeah. It sounds amazing. And we went in and we tried, you know, we recorded Rhythm Section Live. Um, you know, and of course you come back and track over things that are whatever, but I, I just, it, it's, a mag it's, it's magical in there. And so, you know, a lot of my father's stuff is tied up in, uh, you know, who owns this, who owns that, rights, and but his. But when he passed away, his catalog was a mess. Um, the capital stuff, uh, we had uh, Jim had talked to them. We actually step back. Yeah. So we, we, my dad got his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2010. Yeah, it was presented to you. Were there for the presentation? They presented it to you, if I'm not correct, right? Yes. So this actually was instigated and, and the entire event was made possible by my management team. 
and a friendship with uh, uh, the Montalban Theater. Uh, th there was a lot of things that happened to make it happen on, and that was the, the star anniversary, it was their anniversary celebration. We performed live at the star ceremony. It was a brilliant event. So we get done playing and we all change and we walk because my one of my managers had said that uh, Capitol Records was opening their doors for the first time to the public ever. Wow. And they were doing little tours. So we go running down there and there's 10,000 people trying to get in. And uh, uh, Michael Licata, my mouthpiece at the time, <laughs> ran up to the door and said, that's Louis Prima Jr. We're coming in. And they let us in yeah. in front of everybody. And they are they're demonstrating the echo chambers using Sing Sing Sing. Oh, wow. Um, and they've got huge pictures and cutouts and the room set up exactly like it was in the pictures of my father in that studio. And I'm like, wow, this is cool. So we get to meet, um, you know, some of the higher ups there. And uh, when it came time to record, you know, we maintained these relationships and Jim Irvin thought it was a great idea. And he thought it was a good idea if we could figure out how to do a duet. Now, the problem with this is my father of Capitol Records recorded everything with two microphones hanging in one. Okay. There were no tracks, there were no nothing. So you can't solo his voice out on most of the hits. Yeah. Um, so there was, there was a couple handfuls, of, there was a handful of songs where the, vo the vocal track was really clean to where you could EQ everything else out and make it work. And uh, one of them was That's My Home. Um, the other ones were kind of, you know, um, and I mean, that's that's my home isn't really a popular number of his, but the rest were like even less so. They were be B sides and things. Yeah. And uh, you know, as as I thought about it, and and I thought about the relationship that I was gaining again uh, with people in New Orleans and how much I play down here, and um, my I've been trying to get back here for a decade. Um, it just seemed like a neat song to do and it worked out great because it was clean um the band could my band could play over it and then he my, my father and i you know would go back and forth on the trumpet and um i i think for the first time i hear something and go wow i, I do sound a little bit like my father and i do play a little bit like him and yeah uh that was cool you know nice. um it's a neat little thing, and when people hear it, they're floored. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely was floored when I heard it, especially when you get at the end and you guys do the duet scat at the end. I was just like, oh, man, I guess. Yeah. You know, it, those are the things, those are the emotions, not just the, the fun and everything. Those are the emotions that music could bring, too, where it's just like, I can't put myself specifically in your shoes, but, you know, we've all lost someone, and to be able to share that moment with someone like your father, nonetheless... I mean, after, uh, you know, post-grave, post I mean, that must have just been such a moving, even listening uh, to it, it's moving just to be a irreplaceable it, moment. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a irreplaceable moment that not a lot of people get to have. And, and it was, it was neat, man. It was, it was neat. And uh, spoiler alert, there may or may not be a new one, another one on the new album. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to hear the new album, man. I really can't. You said that's coming out in the fall, right? Yeah, yeah, we music. actually finished recording. We walked out of Capitol Records, and the next day, the world shut down. Okay. Um, I actually went and finished up vocal tracks, uh, and I, I rode my motorcycle to L.A. from Vegas, and they, I was the only guy on the road. I mean, there was everybody was inside. Um, Wait, that's how you. That's how you rolled in. That's how you rolled in. To, I'm sorry to cut you off. That's how you rolled into Capitol Records. Is on your on your bike from 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 Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. See, that's some rock star <laughs> shit right there. You got you yeah. to gotta let that be known a little bit more. I did. Look, <laughs> you can take the rock and roll, uh, the guy out of the rock and roll. You can't take the rock out of the guy. Um, we, so we, you know, as we sat and watched, you know, we all sat and waited and waited and waited and waited. And you hope that, okay, this is going to be a month. Okay. It's going to be a month and 15 days, all right, 15 more days, two months, three months. And, and as everything's canceling and falling off, we just sat on it. And uh, we, uh, Jim and I talked 
a couple months ago and, uh, you know, looking at what our schedule was looking like, cause you know, you, um, it, it's, it's hard to explain to a lot of people the difference between recording an album yourself and, you know, pressing it on CD baby and getting it out and dealing with the record label and universal music distribution, where you have guidelines, you got to live by, you've got to have tour dates, you've got to have promotions, you got to have all the things in place. And none of us had any of that in place. So only the Uber rich were putting anything out. Yeah. So we, we talked, we looked at the schedule and said, all right, let's mix it. Cause it's literally, we're mixing it right now. Um, and let's try to get it out the end of summer, early fall. Let's get, let's keep an eye on the schedule on what's going on. And so we're, as long as the schedule keeps building, we're good. Um, and it's just going to be a, when we get it done, hopefully by the end of summer, hopefully by the time we, you know, in the thick of touring in August, maybe, um, if it's a little bit later, I don't mind. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to get it out because it is, um, all original with the exception of the one maybe surprise and the one other maybe surprise. <laughs> I like it. I like surprises. There's two little tunes that, yeah. So it's a, this, this was a, a long time in the work. So we started writing these songs several years ago um, and we're forced to make some personal changes uh, moving forward um, and then delays and, you know, yeah, 100, everything. 100 million things that control what you do in this business. Absolutely. Um, and we're glad to have gotten it recorded and, and excited to get it, get it out there because it's, uh, I think it's another step in the direction I want to go. I don't know. It's probably not the final step. Um, but it's, it's a, it's, it's getting close to the end of where I think album number four will be the sound and the idea that we all have for this band. And, uh, I'm just, uh, we're all ecstatic to just get it there yeah. and get it out and see what the people think, you know? Now, if it, you, you're mentioning the, the timeline of your tour and the album release, do you think you'll be playing any, any songs from the new album on your tour or do you think you'll wait until it's released? <clears throat> yes, we, we, we actually, uh, played a couple on our last couple of dates, um, before, uh, actually before we recorded them, um, just, you know, as testers, just to yeah. see what, what would happen. Um, and we will get them out there. Of course, we have to actually rehearse now. But <laughs> <laughs> Oh, those pains in the ass rehearsals they can be. Damn it. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, we'll, we, we will try to kick some in there as we move along, um, you know, depending on the venue and things and, and where we're playing and uh, – it's always exciting to put something out there and see what the people think live. Uh, cause you may think it's great and it just may be a clunker and, uh, and the, the ones you think are awful, you know, yeah, you never people know. want to hear. <laughs> so speaking of putting things out there though, and, uh, and, and, uh, just seeing what the, what the people would think. I mean, I noticed, you know, blow could also be part of, you know, blowing the horns and stuff, but I couldn't help but notice the way blow was written on the album cover. Uh, you mentioned you were in a rock band through the eighties. I, I have to imagine you, you, you've had your, your, your stents with blow. Um, look, what, what, what was, or who came up with that? What, what was the idea? They were just tongue in cheek. It, it was 100% me and it was pretty much all tongue in cheek. And it started off as a joke. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually started off. So, we we got into the studio and we did not have an instrumental song and uh we we got into the studio and um uh, marco my sax player came in with the idea and we worked it out while we were in there and it's one of those songs that we couldn't use a click track to start the band off um just because of the intro Mm -hmm. And so as we were, you know, Marco, as we're getting ready to record the rhythm section, Marco's in a little, in that little room that goes into the control booth, the Studio B. Yep. And over the microphone, he says, um, are you ready? I'm just going to blow. <laughs> and he blows. And 
we ended up keeping that as the intro to the album. We added the, when I say, hey, you know, on the, on the album, I say, hey, Marco, why don't you play that number you've been working on? And he says, yeah, 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 all right, all right, all right. That we added before, after the fact, but the, all right, I'm just going to blow. That was, was the original first take of oh, that's trying awesome. to record the rhythm section. So when it came time to name the song, I was like, just call it blow. And we all agreed mainly because I think I'm doing with horns in, in music, what a, hasn't been done since maybe tower of power that p- horns oh, are power. so much of a little back incident and I'm throwing them out there in front, you know, yeah. and, and it's, it's an integral part of the music. So blow made sense. Um, <clears throat> so then we move forward to what are we going to name the album? And, uh, uh, I, I thought blow was a good name for the album. Um, and it immediately got kicked back. Well, people are going to think you're talking about blow. <laughs> and I said, well, what if I am talking? About <laughs> yeah. What if, what if, what if, what if I am? <laughs> so we're going back and forth a little bit. And I came up with a, a good friend of ours, Althea in uh, Boston had taken the album cover picture. Um, which I thought was a brilliant album cover picture. I had my, my oldest son uh, is an artist and tattoo artist, he did a right? lot of touch up. Yeah. Uh, yep. Tattoos and, and brilliant artist as well. Uh, but he, um, he did most of the touch up work on it, cleaning it up, getting rid of some of the lights and things to give it the, what it was. And I said, I go, I want, I have seen somebody do this um, like within the month that we were going back and forth over blow. My management company was adamant. We weren't going to call it blow Jim from the record label is just sitting in the chair, laughing, watching it all happen. Um, <laughs> That's where I'd be too. <laughs> <laughs> somebody had, somebody had taken a stick and drawn a word in sand and then did a negative image of it. Yeah. And it looked so cool. So I said, Jacob, go, draw in the sand, the word blow. And let me see it in sand, like the reverse image. It just said like it had this cool look. Um, So he plops it on the artwork and sends it over to me. And I went, Oh wow, that looks like blow. (laughs) (laughs) uh, As I'm thinking about, you didn't have, you weren't, you weren't (laughs) sure that it was, you just thought it was going to look cool. And then you go, no, I thought Sam. it was going to look cool. I had no idea it was going to look I'm like I'm thinking that. in my head because I've already back. seen it. Maybe just because I've already seen it. But I'm thinking about sand spelling out blow and going, well, yeah, that's going to be, that's going to look like cocaine. But it wasn't like, <laughs> if you can look at the negative image of what it looks like, it was this neat little effect. And he sent that back to me and I'm laughing. And I, I went, okay. And I sent it off to my manager and Jim and Jim's laughing and my no, you can't do that. People are going (sighs) to. So I said, all right, you really want to want to go that far? I got the, I got it back. Told Jacob, I said, throw some dust on it. (laughs) Because it it was just like, (laughs) he made it, he made it worse. And I kid you not, I could, I could find it right now and send it to you. I sent them a mock-up on, on the artwork. You know, when you submit the artwork, I stuck it on there and submitted it. And at the top, I had a razor blade with my logo on it. And I said, there, now what do you think? Oh, man. <laughs> That's of brilliant. Course, Jim Irvin's laughing his ass off. <laughs> and uh, my management company is in an uproar. And I was like, I called him. I go, look, I'm just playing. But I really think this is there. And I like the tongue in cheek of it. Yeah. Um, you convinced it, me. Uh, let people that you know look uh no press is bad press uh (laughs) if if it gets you if it gets you talking about it it gets you talking about it we've had some funny conversations over it i literally um i went to the world war the world war ii museum here in new orleans has a brilliant stage and things and a few years ago uh for you know total backstory they don't like me because my sister doesn't like me um, wait, what, wait, but, what, what, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wait a so, second. <laughs> anyway, so we go, we go We're in coming there back to that. And, and I'll come back. And my mother had had dealings with them, uh, during the whole 2010 jazz fest for my father. Mm-hmm. 
so we went in there and had a meeting and said, look, how do I, how do I get to come down here and do a couple of shows? How do, how do we budget this out? I mean, I know it's a small room and she gets, she sits, she sits and heavy sign goes, I don't think you're right for our crowd. I said, well, why don't you think I'm right for your crowd? She goes with all of your cocaine references, all of them. I was like, all of them, <laughs> the album, the album blow. And I went, all right, never mind. <laughs> Picked up my stuff and left. It's just, it's, uh, I like that there was all I, of them. Cause I, I'm like, I'm, I'm interested now. Where, where are the <laughs> other references I missed? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> that was so long ago. Yeah. I, I it, it very, very tongue in cheek. Um, I've gotten a kick out of it. I think, I think 95% of the world looks at that album and goes, Hey, it's referencing cocaine. And oh yeah. They just, and they just don't care. The other 5%, you know what? Go buy another album. Yeah, exactly. Is it this? Oops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the label doesn't like you saying it, but I love it. <laughs> yeah. We talked a little bit about your son as a, as an artist, but um, I also know that you taught him to play drums. You've actually had him up on stage with you a few times. Um, two different. Well, that's different son. So my, oh, so my oldest sons, okay. son. Yep, my oldest son Jacob. Um, he actually left Vegas a couple years ago. He's living in Arkansas. Uh, uh, went down to help a friend at a tattoo shop. He's a brilliant artist. I actually have artwork of his laying up on the walls in the house. He's, he's brilliant, amazing artist, uh, amazing little twist, little mind. And, uh, we, um, it's me and his younger brother that actually kind of talked him into doing tattoos to make a living because he's interested in tat, you know, I'm obviously tattooed. Yeah. And, has he done any tattoos? Uh, for he you? was, he, yes, he has. Awesome. He's got, uh, I don't know if you can see the, the, oh, the, the treble clef. clef and the bass clef nice. on the back. And a um, couple of little small things, but uh, we we kind of talked him into doing it to, to earn a living, to help support him in his art endeavors. And I had a very close friend of mine, Wayne Harmon in Las Vegas, Painless Wayne, um, apprenticed him and, and really pushed him through rather quickly. If you talk to a lot of uh, tattoo artists, their apprenticeship was always a nightmare. Yes. Um, but Wayne, Wayne got him through pretty quick and got him making money pretty quick. And, you know, he enjoys it. It's an avenue to do his art and he's brilliant at it. Um, my youngest son and they both, they both played music in school, but my youngest son by accident in high school, uh, started playing drums. He walked into, they scheduled him in the wrong class. So he walked in with a trumpet into this drum. He, he walked in with a trumpet into a drum corps. <laughs> and they were like, uh, can you play drums? He goes, well, if you teach me. Yeah. <laughs> and we had a drum set at the house, but he goes, well, if you teach me. Um, and then the same thing happened in the orchestra. Like he got in the orchestra, the marching band, one of the two, and they had too many trumpet players and not enough drummers. And can you play the drums? Well, if you, you know, teach me. Yeah. And, uh, he actually, his senior year, he was on the snare, which is a coveted position in a core. Yes. Uh, and he's super, ta super, super, super talented. And yeah, he's, he's gotten on stage with me. He's, <laughs> I moved him down in New Orleans in July uh, by himself. I uh, drove him down here and he was, you know, doing little sit-ins already. Uh, he loves the drums, uh, but his reason for moving to New Orleans was to become a fireman. And he just got hired at the Kenner fire department and starts on Monday. So he's wow. Uh, Congratulations happy. to yeah. him. That's uh, that's and, and to you as a father, that's, that's incredible. Hey, father's day. We're talking about father's shit. Right. <laughs> and speaking of father's um, day look, coming he, up on he, Sunday, he, let's do a little, we'll get to get to your father in a second here, but I just want to say, you know, Sunday's father's day, everybody, you know, a perfect gift might be a ticket to, for your father to Louis Prima Jr. coming to a city near you. I don't know. Maybe that's a good gift right. for, for, for Father's Day. I'll even sing Happy Father's Day to you. <laughs> I don't, I, I'm not sure I've heard that one, but uh, I'm sure you can come up with something for us. I don't know. Look, <laughs> I'll make it up. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of experience with that, I'm sure. Um, we talked a, uh, a little bit about, about your father, Louis Prima. Um, 
Huge fan, as I said. I These records that I've shown uh, throughout the conversation, a couple of them here, I inherited from my late grandfather. When he passed away, I got all these records, all these meticulously. He was super OCD. Awesome. I mean, they're kept perfect, and I get to listen to them and do my best to keep them as well. Um, oh, cool. So I just want to talk a little bit about your father, if we're okay with that. And uh, namely, yeah. some of your memories. I know that uh, he passed away. I think you were you were fairly young. How old were you? Um, he actually went into surgery for a brain tumor in, I was in the, uh, I was nine and, and, uh, it was in a coma for three years. He passed away when I was 12. Um, so it was, uh, I do have a lot of memories though. I mean, I was, he had, uh, five wives and six daughters and I was the last one in the sun. And I was, uh, you know, he drug me around everywhere he went when he was in Vegas and we went on the road with him during the summers and just, I do have vivid memories of every bit of it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's incredible. I mean, even at an early age and um, you know, I'm sure you, you could prescribe to this is going through something that traumatic at an early age kind of forces you to grow up. Does it not? Yes. Yeah. It, it rather quickly, it, um, you know, uh, my, my father was huge to me. You know, they, here's a character that's bigger than life. And he taught me humility. He taught me how to be kind to people. Uh, he would drag me around in public and he never, never was too busy for somebody that stopped him just to say hello. Um, and he taught me how to laugh because that's all he wanted to do was laugh and have a good time. And uh, we didn't, you know, we didn't see him a lot. He was on the road a lot. Uh, he only did, you know, when he had a Vegas residency, it was only 22 weeks a year. The rest of the time he was on the road. Uh, I have pictures. My sister and I made a daddy doll because we missed him. Um, but he was bigger than life and, and you know, uh, and young when he got sick comparatively. Oh, yeah. Um, so it, uh, you know, and, and. You know, it's it's rough to see. So, you know, it's rough to see anybody laying in a hospital bed and you can't talk to them. They can't talk to you for three years. And it's rough watching uh, my mother go through that because she would. We were living in Las Vegas. He had the surgery at Mount Sinai Hospital, and my mother lived in a motorhome in the parking lot um, for a year during the what was the guy that the the Hillside Strangler. Oh yeah, that was going on, and my mom's like living by herself in a in a parking lot, and uh, people like Bill, people like Bill Cosby came and banged on her door and made her come to his house for Thanksgiving dinner because you know yeah she was just there by herself because yeah. he was a nice guy who'd have thunk it. Well, but, yeah, I mean, and then we moved him. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like the, now, we, hindsight, you know, we, now that that's that that story doesn't uh, doesn't play out very well. <laughs> that doesn't hold a lot of weight. I'm like, come on. He was a nice guy. Um, so, you know, my mom moved him to uh, 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 Oshner Clinic here in New Orleans, and we were living North Lake. And for those not familiar with the area, North Lake, uh, Lake Pontchartrain is the north shore of uh, New Orleans and, you know, the New Orleans proper and New Orleans, the whole area. And there's a 25 mile long bridge over water to get to the North shore, which is Covington, Slidell and areas like that. So we lived in Covington. The population was 6,000 people when we were there. And my mother commuted every day uh, in the New Orleans and, you know, sat by the bedside every day for three years wow. and uh, went on the road and, you know, tried to do some music on the interim and things like that. And it's, you know, it's tough, it's tough on a family, it's tough on kids. Um, it does force you to grow up and, you know, I always look back as it on it as a positive thing because I was forced to grow the fuck up and do the right thing and support yourself. And, you know, there, there's a lot of pluses that I got from it. So yeah. I never look back on it in, as anger or any kind of excuse for anything that I've ever done wrong in my life, which there are plenty of things. Um, uh, for all but of I, us. I just did, you know, it's it. I always view it as a positive. It really forced me. Um, into adulthood, uh, probably in a time that I didn't want to be an adult, but 
I did it and it and survived somehow. Now you're able to, you know, continue the name um, as as the junior and getting out there and creating your own music now, um, which has got to be really awesome. I mean, to come back to it after so many years too. Um, it's, a, it's a neat, li- it's a neat little circle to come back to, you know. Yeah. And it's a, it's a I, very I intriguing you. story to me. I mean, it really is. Like even prior. Well, I, look, I'm, 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 I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate. I'm blessed. I say it a million times, and I really am. Um, a to just you know, I, I come from a legacy that a lot of people don't come from, and. I see a lot of people in similar situations um, uh, get myself in trouble, squander the opportunities that they're given um, to create and be their own person. And I never wanted to be, I I love my father. I love the music. I love the style, but I never, ever, ever wanted to be a tribute band or to rely on it. Uh, I wanted, I, and I fought it for a lot. I mean, that's what rock and roll was. I was fighting it. Um, and I finally got to a place in my brain where I could, I viewed it as I'm, I'm using it as a tool to get where I'm going. And I'm fortunate that it has allowed me to get where I'm going and hopefully I can continue getting there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, last couple of things I want to ask about, uh, in regards to your father, um, a lot of ties to the Rat Pack, did some stuff with Sinatra, a lot of that fun stuff. Were you, did you have any Memories? Did you did you get to meet some of the guys in the Rat Pack at some point when you're early on, or were they pretty much? Do you have any Look, anything I, that I don't remember meeting Sinatra ever, um, but we met. I mean, I met everybody um, because my father had the golf course in Las Vegas, and yeah. a lot of the a lot of the celebrities would come out and play that course rather than one of the more popular ones. So you know, people like uh, Dean Martin, Jimmy Durante, uh Sammy Davis Jr. I, I got to meet uh, um, Joe Frazier after <laughs> the day after Muhammad Ali beat him. Oh um, wow! Yeah, there, there's there's uh, Debbie Reynolds, um, Al Hurt. I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on. But it's weird. Like as a kid, you, I didn't. Know, I like I thought these were just dad's friends, you know. And, and I think I never really, as a kid, you know. Even though I'm going to shows, we used to sit in the sound booth at the Sands and watch the shows and go on the road and see them. I, I, I don't think it was ever anything different. I thought that was normal, right? normal childhood. Um, so it's, uh, it's weird to, you know, maybe I would have got a better view or a different view of it had it been, you know, high school or teen years. But as a kid, that was my normal life. And I'm, uh, you know, I had fond memories of all of it. I mean, look, I was in the recording studio and my father recorded his last song, which was ironically his only ballad. And it was called I'm Leaving You. So wow. I, there's vivid memories of everything that, you you know, and, and um, I, I, I look back on them and smile. You know, there was uh, there was no, I don't know, it's weird. You, you, you hear a lot of Hollywood trappings and, you know, I know all the bad stories about my father. We had to drag them all out through the, you know, his will took 14 years to settle and we had to drag everything from his past up. Um, but I, you know, for the most part, we didn't have any of those trappings. It was, you know, every, it was every, every Sunday he drug us out of bed and took us to church at six in the morning and made us smile and, poured coffee down our throats and <laughs> five o'clock when he was home, five o'clock was dinner every night. It was a regular Italian household. I, I don't, you know, yeah. Um, I'm fortunate, fortunate. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, it's, that's really great. I get to hear that. I, you touched upon one other thing that I, that I'd be remiss to ask about. Cause I, I just picked up golfing a couple years ago. So you grew up on the course. Your father had yes. the course. What kind of? I mean, are you a, are you a golfer? What kind of golfer was your dad? I mean, are they was was he? What was his handicap, if you recall, or anything? Well, he, uh, so he, he so he actually had two courses. He had one in Covington, Louisiana, mm-hmm. um, that he built for his mother, uh, and he had one in Vegas. And I grew, you know, that's uh, I grew up on both. My childhood was split between the two places, and I played every day with him as much as I could. 
he was a good golfer. I don't remember what his handicap was, um, but when I'd be out with him and his friends or people playing with him, he, I, you know, I know that he was competitive. He played well. I played well when I was, uh, when I was uh, 10 or 11 years old, I had a 12 handicap, which is probably unheard of for that age. And I know, I'd probably incredible. be really good if I kept, I don't even well, want to, I, I don't even want I to tell you what my handicap is now. I've only been playing for two years. Well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> it, I'm not even close to that now. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I didn't play for a lot, a lot, a lot of years. And I, I picked it back up kind of regularly, uh, I, think was, was, I, I picked it up after I had my shoulder operated on just to see if I could still swing. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been through like I. There's two. Like there, there's actually two ways of looking at the of what if your sentence you just said to see if I could still swing is like, like kind of getting back into music too, right? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I do play. I don't I don't have a handicap right now. I I haven't really even sat down to even try. I play right now just for the enjoyment of it. Um, I love to play and we, um, we, we were going to, uh, me and my drummer AD who loves to play golf, we were going to throw the clubs in the bus and try to hit courses on days off. That is, that is the way to go. Our singer's been doing that for many years and I always was like, man, that's silly. And then two years ago I picked up golf and I'm like, I can't wait to get back out on the road and bring my clubs. Right. (laughs) It's so much fun. Well, we do, we do things like a, on a day off. If there's a ball game somewhere, we'll go. We'll all go to the ball game or something like that. But um, I I like to play. I, I I think playing is relaxing. I'm not one of them guys that gets all mad when you shank a ball or something. It's, uh, my friend told me. My friend told me early on when I was getting a little frustrated with myself. He said, "Don't worry, you're not good enough to get mad." And then, <laughs> and I take that down. Like that's, that's true. Awesome. I'm not. I'm not joining any tours for. I'm not joining a BJ. No, I'm not. I am. There's. <laughs> there was no way I would even bet on golf. I do it completely for fun. Yeah, because, I like uh, to get out there, have I, a couple I of drinks, maybe it. smoke a cigar, and hit some balls. You know, that's that's what it's all that's about. That's exactly it. I can't wait. We, we should we should golf sometime down the line if we if we get a chance. I'd love to do that. I, I can't wait to go out. Um, everyone, make sure you go check out Louis Prima Jr at louisprimajr.com, Louis Prima, Louis Prima Jr., easy enough for me to say, uh, on Instagram, um, and check out all the tour dates coming soon. Uh, last note, I got to ask about um, if you could send us off with uh, one one great story you have from uh, your father on this uh, Father's Day edition, if you have one that stands out, one memory or one moment that uh, just kind of encapsulates your guys' relationship early on. Wow, there's a lot. Um, I, I don't know if it encapsulates uh, our relation. I, I, we were, you know, we were close. My father liked to laugh. He um, he did a lot of stuff with with us as kids. He was a family man. Um, but I think it I think it speaks to his person a lot when he. So it was about 1972. Um, he had a, a what they believed at the time was a heart attack. Uh, and doctors told him he had to stop playing the trumpet. And this is a guy. So, you know, my, my, my father's 12 years old in New Orleans and he teaches himself how to play the trumpet um, because my uncle played the trumpet and my dad played the violin and my dad didn't think the violin was cool. So he taught himself how to play the trumpet at his first band at 14 years old. We're talking 1924. Uh-huh. I mean, when you think about the scope of this, yeah. Um, and he eventually had a 50 year career. He had a, when you look at popular music um, and, and people in music, you know, you've got bands and artists that last decades. Um, but were they big in every decade? My father had a hit in every single decade. He was relevant in every yeah. decade um, through the small combos, through the big band era, through the small, you know, in the rock and roll. He had a hit in every decade and was popular. And all of that was centered around his trumpet playing. Um, great singer and great entertainer, uh, but he, you know, his trumpet sound and, and the way he played was his thing. And he loved it. He loved it with all his heart. And they told him to stop playing. Um, and he did stop for quite a few years. And we were on the road with him um, one summer and he was playing at a place called Palumbo's in South Philly. Uh, I know that I believe the believe the place just actually closed and um sounds familiar actually so 
Yeah, I, I was I was there in the I was there uh, in the able to see the show, and we would sit at the bar, and I drank a uh, vodka tonic, or I'm sorry, uh, tonic water and lime because it looked like booze. <laughs> no I was like, for cold. a second, I was like, wait, they served that to you? No, I'm trying I, to do the math no, in my head. I'm like, um, well, you weren't old enough to drink. <laughs> Well, my, my father would pour us wine no matter where we, I mean, I was bottle fed wine, but you know, I was sitting at the bar and I got my fake drink and I think I was eight years old and my favorite aunt, my aunt Virginia on my mom's side, um, who just recently passed away. This woman, this woman taught, uh, in, uh taught elementary school her entire career. She li- literally married her high school sweetheart and lived in the same house for 60 years. Wow. Um, that's not unheard of. These sweetheart days. of a woman. Yeah, and my mom and dad are on stage, and my dad, um, my dad, uh, briefly on on the mic tells the story that he hasn't played the trumpet in uh, in three years, and he doesn't give a shit what the doctors think anymore. And he reaches back and pulls out his trumpet, and he does a song called "I'm Confessing." He he has an album. He did it on late in his career. It's a brilliant, slower paced uh, love song. Uh, with one of the greatest solos in the world on it. And he sang that song while I'm dancing with my favorite aunt and ripped that solo out. And uh, it was just amazing. I, I, you know, vivid memories of it and going, yeah, they told him he can't play the trumpet. What do they know? You know? And uh, I think, and and it, one of the things I'm, I'm, the same guy as him. I don't like doing ballads. I'm not a balladeer. I'm not going to sing you a love song. Yeah. So it's really not going to happen. Um, but I do that song and I tour with the, my father's trumpet that he had in his hand that day. And wow. it's the only time I feel that I shine on the trumpet and I get to tell the story, you know, that this is, this is, uh, you know, that that was a shining moment to me from my father to stand up to the world and go, I'm, I'm doing what I want because I'm standing up and doing what I want and fortunate to be doing it. Yeah. No, that is so, so incredible. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for being on the show, man. Yeah. I really appreciate the time. We went a little long and uh, well, I'll, I'll let you get going here. I'd love to do it again when the world allows us and uh, really throw a little party. It's, it's, it's been a blast. I'm, like I said, I'm a huge fan and thank you. Uh, you need anything from me on there. And I hope you get a chance to come out and see us. Um, I'm sure you could dig the show and brush up on a number and come on up with us. I don't I'd care. Love, I'd, I would love nothing more than that. That would be great. We'll have some drinks and have some fun with it. Again, everyone, go check out Louis Prima Jr. Hell yeah. Everywhere you find Louis Prima Jr., easy enough to find. And uh, until next time, we'll see you guys. Cheers. And that's going to do it for this week's episode, this very special Father's Day edition. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks to Louis Prima Jr. for being on the show. That's right. It's Father's Day on Sunday, and if you're looking for the perfect gift, Look no further than drinkswithjohnny.com. All the perfect gifts for your father. Make sure you go out and support the show that you've had so much fun watching and we've had so much fun making. Make sure you subscribe right down below. Turn on your notifications. As I said, we are going to be starting to talk directly to you guys through your subscription right here on YouTube. So make sure you turn your notifications on the app as well as on your phone. And uh, I think I've spoken enough. Thank you guys so much. And as always, till next time, cheers. Cheers.